So I just wanted to talk about today, kind of for the next half hour, about being introduced to like what multimedia composition is kind of it can be really hard for people to know where to start if they've got some experience as a sound producer or engineer or music producer or as a performer um and i just you know i would love to encourage more people just basically to write music um and i love films and i've, I've been a multimedia composer for five years and that's what i studied for four years at uni so for a long time and i, I just love it and i would love for more people to be able to feel like they can do that as well I think the great thing, and tell, tell me if you, if you agree, Tamara, there has never been a better time in history to try something like this because you can download stock footage, you can download free sample libraries, you can download free DIWs, and you can compose and practice and practice and build a showreel without anybody's permission. And you can teach yourself with online resources like Linda. Yeah, oh, Linda, LinkedIn Learning, amazing. Completely agree. Like, there's no excuse not to learn now. The knowledge is so accessible, the technology that we have today, like that it wouldn't be a hindrance. Like, it would be such an asset to them. And I, you know, trying to use, uh, yeah, all of this access to, to education and to knowledge to our advantage is so right. Um, and it's so exciting. Like, you know, there's more people in the world and people are able to be more expressive and, and to find new avenues to express themselves. And I think that's a really positive thing that we can access that and anyone can access that. What is like, what is multimedia composition? Because it seems like quite a convoluted and kind of a wanky term. Um, but the reason that I use that is because it kind of encompasses everything um in in the world and the kind of art that we consume now it is multidisciplinary so we've got like games and um, whether they're interactive games or narrative games or rpgs or first person um and then you've got you know books and films and tvs and web series and social media and stories and all kinds of stuff that are just constantly engaging you um and advertisements and all of those have sound and music with them so you know, when people ask me, it's like, oh, what do you write music for? And how do you get work and all this stuff? And it's like, well, anytime you open anything on your phone or your device, um, you'll hear stuff. Or you turn on the radio, you hear stuff. You walk into the supermarket, you hear stuff. That doesn't come out of thin air. So it's kind of, you know, being a, a part of that and recognizing that, okay, there's, there's this uh, whole disposition of, of arts that um, can be accompanied by music. And that's, what multimedia composition kind of is like uh, and sound sculpting as well so like working with like physical sculptors and paintings and that interactive art and dance as well so like dance and multimedia there's so many wonderful like different ways that we can incorporate technology and art as musicians and sound people so it shouldn't just kind of be limited to like film scoring and game scoring I feel it's kind of as long as you're creating something in conjunction or in support of another discipline that's what we're talking about like give yourself a brief or a narrative something with a storyline whether that storyline is wow that's a really beautiful landscape of a mountain what does that sound like and it seems like a really incred incredible question to ask yourself um but that's kind of the first step into you know being a, a songwriter perhaps and, and then being uh, a multimedia composer it's like okay well i have this um you know, this brief or this idea in front of me and I have to create a sonic world for that. And whether that's with sound design elements or that's with a piano or that's with my dog snoring and turning that into a sample instrument, it's kind of trying to work out what that sounds like. And, you know, this kind of goes back, this isn't a new thing, like soundscaping goes back to the early 60s uh, with people like Murray Schaefer um, and Barry Tro and all these wonderful people um, that have kind of helped evolve what electronic music is and how we experience it in this uh, multidisciplinary form. So I really like, I encourage people to, when they want to start doing this is like, take an idea, like take your favorite book or an audio podcast um, or a film that you love or a scene that you love or a game. And then like reimagine that if there is music to it or create a musical world that doesn't exist yet. And yeah, like what you're saying before, Simon, like what are the tools required? I think the best point is like my last one there, like your creativity is limitless. Like you could have nothing and we've all started with nothing. And often that's where we look back and go, wow, I was really creative then. So setting even really strict kind of limits for yourself, if you do have access to a lot of stuff um, can really help you. But in terms of this, I suppose like 
modern full-time kind of music for for multimedia platforms it's just finding a door that you're comfortable with like they're all wonderful and as long as you've got access to something that you can work in quickly and it works well with your workflow that's all you need um yeah the access to midi uh i live for midi midi makes me so happy um it's just about bringing stuff to life um when you can't get access to real musicians i will of course always work with real musicians when the project has the budget and the timeline for it you just can't go past working with with real people um but having access to um any kind of midi libraries um, and just a space that you can record as clean and as clear audio as you possibly can um and then yeah i kind of put this point in there i wasn't sure i should but orchestral synthestration it's kind of this um you know tool now that because hiring an orchestra is about you know anywhere between 10 and thirty thousand dollars an hour so not many projects have the capacity to do that so it's our role as composers when a brief calls for orchestral instruments to be able to what's called midi mock-up um uh, it, to sound as realistic as an orchestra as we possibly can and there's a lot of skills involved there it's not quite just finding a fantastic spitfire library and then just playing it in um which is easy to get trapped into because there are some wonderful sample libraries out there that do sound really good as soon as you play them but there's a lot of midi finessing that you need to do so things like um changing the expression and modulation things like portamento and vibrato so thinking about all the things that um are synonymous with the instrument that you're writing for to make it sound more realistic so there's a lot of kind of midi programming that's involved programming for orchestras because uh, a couple of things you know, I, I do a lot of orchestral recording and, you know, lucky enough to work on projects where we can record the MSO or, you know, outsource to, you know, I often use the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra and do nice. sessions. And even in those sessions, I'll often augment the recording with larger than life samples, but they have to be programmed right. And the other thing just on, on the programming is, you know, I've heard, I've heard synthesized, you know, programmed orchestra mock-ups done with Pro Tools built-in sound library and anyone that's used Pro Tools will know how bad it is. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, and, and his MIDI mock-ups with the stock standard library sounded better than some of the MIDI mock-ups done with the Spitfire library that I've heard from other people. And that's it. And how to arrange. So, you know, when you understand how to arrange, you can get so much more from your even just your crappy Pro Tools library. So yeah. everything you said is so important to learn how to use the tools and learn about the expressions um, and you know the range of an instrument and the phrases that an instrument would play and wouldn't play. Um, I just completely agree. So like it's not to take away from the real musicians. It's just it really is a skill in itself to be able to, you know, program like that. And, and you might have a wonderful library, but if you don't work on the programming or understand basic arrangement skills, you know, the best place to start with, you know, orchestration, anyone will tell you is 101. Look at Rimsky korsakovs orchestration book and then go from there. You know, if you need somewhere to start. One, the biggest pro with working with real life musicians is that one it saves you a lot of time in the programming world so with things like expression and your breath and, and you know because even if, you, if I'm programming something like clarinet in and I'm not playing it you know you've got to think oh well okay well they can't hold a note for, for 40 seconds because they'll pass out um, so you know things like that and the texture and you get the um, the sounds of the keys and the way that they would play that instrument um, and I think especially for more complex passages it's really great or for solo passages so what i'll often do is i'll have a, a mock-up of something especially if it's quite a thick texture um with you know 60 plus instruments i'll try and get one uh instrument from each family to come in so like a flute uh, a, a violin a french horn and and some percussion and layer it on top and it kind of softens out the the midi synthestration underneath but it, it gives it all of that juicy texture that solo texture um on the top so that's where it's a pro i suppose the con would be if, if it is a very simple kind of pad like line you might not need to and um, it might even take longer by recording you know if, if you're trying to play in i don't know two or three chords and they're triads and um, you know trying to do that 
with a real instrumentalist and then you know you have to retune and and you know you want to take out all of those lovely nuances from the instrument maybe that's where I wouldn't use or, or look for using a real instrumentalist if it was playing more of a pad like role um pros of using midi um it's really it's quite quick um and it saves a lot of money that's probably the biggest pro is that it, it saves money um and that's what project um leaders and, and producers that i are always looking for um, I'll always ask at the start of the project what's the budget and I'll delegate depending on what kind of music is required um, you know to real musician or real musicians if if I can and when I can absolutely um, but yeah the con again is finance I think what do you think Simon am I missing stuff oh, no I think that's pretty spot on yeah. um, you know MIDI the the beautiful thing about MIDI is that it is, it's fast, it's flexible until the very end, um, and it's much more cost effective. You did mention before about how an orchestra can be ten to $30,000 an hour, and I just wanted to reiterate that in case people missed it. Am I supporting or working with the story and the narrative? And that's, you know, what I wanted to talk about from the beginning. And that's where I always come back to. It's always about the story. Um, and the story might not even call for an orchestral instrument. It might call for samples from my kettle. And then I turn that into a sample instrument. And that's the whole score. You know, I've worked on a project at the end of last year that was a classic Australian horror. Um, right. It was so great. It was a wonderful film. Um, but obviously like very, very scary. And so I thought, wow, like all of these things are looking at things like, you know, sexual assault and snuff and they're very violent and confronting. So I was like, what sounds violent and confronting? So, um, I'm really lucky. My fiance makes contact instruments, which is really good for me. So, um, I was like, okay, I want to get samples of you and, and me, um, as close as we can to the mic, making really disgusting sounds. Um, and then we did that and we did that with our dog as well. And that became the whole score, save for like a couple of kind of taiko drums and some string stabs. But the whole score for two and a half hours of this film was just taking those samples and, you know, time stretching them, like flexi pitching them, putting them through a bunch of kind of audio effects. But that was it. And it was about, okay, well, like, how can I challenge myself as a composer not to go, okay, horror, your beauty. All right, I'm going to bring up all my scary strings. I was like, no, no, no. It's got to be more kind of intellectual than that for something like this, especially, you know, being um, a violent assault and very horrific kind of in your face camcorder kind of scenes. I was like, oh, if I romanticize this with orchestral strings, it won't it won't make sense emotionally. It needs to be these raw kind of things. So it might not even need orchestral stuff. You, yeah, always come back to the emotion. I think like when, when people get stuck with, oh, okay, you know, I want to be a film scorer or making some sound sculpting or I want to get into game music, like what do I do? And I have lots of students ask me, I was like, have you written any music lately? And they're like, oh, no. It's like, well, you need to write some music, man. Like you need, a, you need to get on your gear or you need to get on your instrument. You need to write some stuff, um, you know, whether that's just you kind of playing around with, with new samples or practicing with your programming or creating a brief for yourself and writing to that. Like you need to be writing music all the time. And it's something that I think a lot of people forget. You know, you look at performers and like they're practicing all day and you look at producers like they're producing all day and you go to composers and, they should be composing all day. So that's kind of the first one, um, the first place to start. Um, I can't stress how important I think music theory is. And I'm not a gear elitist and I'm not a music theory elitist um, or anything like that. Even just having a basic understanding of music theory and diatonicism and chromaticism will really help you work faster. Can I jump in and just reinforce what you said? Because I was a, an aspiring singer-songwriter finishing year 12 in 1999 with a fear of music theory, wanting to study something to do with music. Hmm. So I picked sound production and, you know, fell in love with this. Um, but I was still, you know, an aspiring singer-songwriter and writing and I just had this music theory block and I believed that my brain just wasn't smart enough to do music theory, which was weird because, you know, when I was 15, I was teaching IT and software programming to the class. 
So, you know, it's like, obviously not dumb, but this music theory thing, I feel like an idiot. And, and I, you know, the first half of my music production career with this fear of music theory. And, and then I decided to address that. And it was the most empowering, special thing that I've ever done. And one of the best investments in my career as a music producer, you know, as an example, you know, I show up to, you know, whenever I'm doing recording, I've always got charts with me mm-hmm. and, you know, the, the charts, have rehearsal marks and section marks that match my Pro Tools markers and I can go in there and I can say to the musicians, you know, let's, let's just drop in two bars before letter F and maybe letter F is the bridge and everyone knows, cool, we're going two bars before that section and then we drop in and I can, I, as we're recording, I can, you know, hear that there's a fumble um, you know, halfway through the second verse and I can quickly glance at the chart and I can see the dynamics are the same and the chords are the same and the parts are the same as the first half. I've got it. We don't have to go in. I can do a quick edit. Um, and on top of that, apart from the efficiency, you know, we're talking about 20 to 30 minutes per song, perfect, no editing, working with high level players and having this sort of preparation. You can see it all. And what people think is like, I have a basic music theory is not in fact a basic music theory. And that you're so right. There seems to be this block where people like are afraid of music theory and it's such a wonderful tool. It's such a, a, a powerful tool. It's, you know, I felt as if it was the first time I'd seen music. Music thought, theory is important <laughs> and very cool. <laughs> then what do I do after I start? Um, they're correct. Like now that we've, you know, you're composing a lot and you've set up your, your workflow, um, whether that's, you know, whatever tool you're on with whatever media you're using, with whatever instruments you're using, um, go back to the simplicity of creating limitations for yourself. So like, okay, I'm going to write five minutes and it's just going to be, um, with this cello sample could explore your limitations narratively or dramaturgically. So you could go, all right, I wonder what the sound of waking up late for work, when you've got an important meeting that day sounds like, what does that sound like? Okay. Well, it's going to be, you know, chaotic and it's going to be stressful and it's going to be high energy and it's going to be, you know, kind of impending doom um, for something that's probably going to be okay to be late to. So, you know, you can have these kind of narratives that you can create for me, if I was writing that weird narrative, um, you know, I'd think about like traffic sounds and I would think about coffee machines and I would think about, you know, people that would be in the house when I'm waking up and, you know, maybe screaming children and, and all these things and incorporate, incorporating that into the music to make it more kind of um, involved and, and secluded in its own world. Going back to the compositional elements, like what, what am I going to be looking at rhythmically and tempo wise? What are the textures and the timbres um, melodically and harmonically? How am I going to approach this? So it, it gives you a little bit more kind of directive rather than go, here's a blank canvas. The, the finding sound thing I had a really hard kind of battle with with what this even meant when I was finishing uni because all my teachers and all my (laughs) classmates were telling me like oh we can tell it's you like but you know when you're giving class presentations it's like oh it sounds like you that's your sound and I used to be really like upset by it like I don't have a telltale like everything I make is unique I'm an unique and individual person what do you mean I have a sound and kind of over the years every person that I've worked with is always like oh man I love your sound and I was like but I work with such different sounds what do you mean there is a sound there and that's what makes people kind of come back to me and and what makes me kind of you know, wanting to teach other composers to look at it's like wow I really like working with samples I like to have my traditional instruments over in this world and I'll pull from them the same way that I'll pull from any sound any anything really um, that might be related to the story in some way electroacoustic music practices and that's kind of where I found my sound but if you want to build a career Mm -hmm. then you need a brand your your sound is going to be made up of everything from you know the unintended limitations of what your you know what your world currently is from what you know about the world and outsidely things to insidely things such as the plugins you have um and it's also going to be you know intervals that just feel natural to you so you might off you know there might be sort of a, a motif that makes its way into everything you do and because that feels good and comfortable to you and um 
Yeah, so I, I think you're spot on. I think this is my biggest one and um, and I started to make templates from scratch before a project even started and was like okay this is what I'm going to play with or this is an orchestral one or this is a sampled one or whatever um, this is kind of this photo here I just mocked up really quickly um, for even just a really simple simple as orchestral kind of mock-up on my big badass computer um, I have my orchestral mock-ups got about a hundred uh, tracks because I've got different articulations for each instrument. So I'd have piccolo, staccato, legato. Um, I'd be looking at, you know, different extended techniques as well. So each one would have either three or four different articulations that I can just go into. Um, but like setting templates is such a good place to start. Understanding your MIDI instruments and how to use them. We've spoken about this like throughout the whole time. We know that's important. Um, always go the extra 1%. If you think you're done, you're not done yet. Um, just like the biggest thing that I found is just taking a break um, at the very, like obviously taking breaks while you're working, but after you finish something, whether it's a five minute song or it's a two hour film, like have a day away from it if you can <laughs> with the deadline, but make sure you, you can get at least half a day away to just sit and then come back and listen to it as, as stems and go, okay, I would just, I'm going to take that that was the English online and I'm going to give it to the oboe instead. Like just those tiny, tiny little parts that no one else is probably going to notice. Um, and it's not about people noticing. It's about the whole, the holistic approach. It's like, if you just go that little bit extra, um, give yourself that break and, and come back and go that little bit extra, um, that's oh, that's going to do wonders for you like personally as a creative and for your career as well because people will see that all that little stuff is so important I think um, manage your projects and back up every day <laughs> I back up every day now get a hard drive get multiple hard drives for backing up and managing your data something I do which I think I've only started doing probably the last six months um, is just running all my sessions on Dropbox. Uh, you talked about how you kind of give each project a code yep. and then you can do a search and, you know, find files anywhere that they might be knowing that everything in that project is going to be flagged. I thought that's a really clever little idea. I have two on-site backups. So I've got my work drive and then uh, a network attached drive and a, um, a USB drive. So there's always three copies on site and every couple of weeks I do an off site clone, uh, which is just a hard drive I leave at my parents' place. So if the place, if the house burns down, there's an off site copy. Getting projects is one that like so many people ask me, like people will come for open days where I teach and like people will approach me at um, like film festivals and stuff. It's like, how do you start? How do you start getting projects? Um, like I should have put be present first, but like, like what, all of us are doing like with something like this is just be available and be present like online and physically for people. You know, they send out like 10 emails and they're like, why haven't I gotten a job? And it's like, well, it's kind of sales and marketing what I want for every hundred you send out, you might get one, you know? So it's kind of constantly looking for projects on multiple platforms. It's not like seek. It's not like, you know, job finder, you know, our industry is very different in, in being freelancers and, and we're going to find projects in the nooks and crannies. Um, and it's just knowing where to go. So places like Screen Hub and Screen Australia, um, there's the Australian Directory of Film Directors Network, there's, um, you know, go and have a look at post-production companies like an, and visual, audio-visual companies that are, you know, hired to do marketing content. And they're the ones that are often using stock music. So I kind of go through, can I try and convert them from stock music to using an, a real composer? Um, whether that's me or not, if I can convert them to using a real composer, that's awesome, <laughs> you know. Um, obviously, the hard thing for a lot of editors, especially in TV, is the time turnaround that they get is just ridiculous. So they just often, they just won't have time to work with a composer. There's a, a couple of people that I've worked with very closely over the last year. Um, they're an awesome production company and it's all um, female and non-binary led and um, run which is really cool because it's the first time I've been a part of something like that you know remember to like consume art <laughs> as well and just kind of be a part um, of that community whether it's an online network it's probably all online at the moment which is also really good um, there's plenty of people to engage with and just 
kind of encourage like just keep talking to people it's not always about just getting the job it's about being a part of the community and being present and available um, and with that availability is the time management as well like it's you all know how easy it is to be overworked um, and how easy it is to like get stuck um, but it also makes it hard to then continually be present because if you're not you know you're tired and you're not feeling well you might miss the next deadline or you might miss that email or you might miss that kind of thing so giving yourself some kind of routine with that leeway obviously when we have those ridiculous deadlines that we can get that done and then we give ourselves a break or whatever it is but just realistic time management for projects is like my number one thing right now when you're working with projects if it's not your narrative it's not about you the music is not yours um and that's a wonderful thing it's if if the director doesn't like it it doesn't mean they don't like you and they don't like your music it means that that music that you've written doesn't suit that project and just be prepared to do i suppose a lot of reiterations what i normally do is when i get a new project whether it's someone i've worked with before or someone that's totally fresh i say hey send me any references that you've got um, but what I like to do is take a snippet if you've got a clip or look at the script or the synopsis and I'll give you three to four samples and those samples might be 30 to 60 seconds long and they'll be completely different from each other. And that here are all the directions that I'm presenting to you, you know, which one is kind of calling out to you. It's like, oh, I really like that, but I kind of hate that about it, but I kind of like this other part in that first sample. And it's like, okay, well, that's a bit easier because now it's like, well, I know what's going on there because I made that but it means that I've kind of presented to them a few options and it's not like, here's your music. Keep networking wherever that is. Um, but the best way to network is just be present and available. Um, and yourself, obviously, people will see through that. Um, and yeah, keep working to the narrative uh, and deliverables are a really big thing as well. Just making sure that you're sending the right files and test the file before you send it and to just make sure like spend an extra five minutes going through all your packages and making sure that everything is contained it's at the set it's at the right sample uh rate and bit depth and um it's all synced up properly to the time code so all of those you know deliverables are so so important yeah i mean like it when you're stuck and you don't have film work this is what i do um you know i do still have music production and performance stuff but when i want to focus on composition i will write music and i will sell it on stock libraries um of course it's wonderful to be a composer on a project but the wonderful thing about writing stock music is that it's a great passive income so it's kind of up there and then it just kind of keeps trickling in this is just kind of my online folio you know just making whatever your platform is whether it's a website or on social media or both I've got like my folio and just like a bunch of tracks and I'm contactable I have a blog extra stuff whatever so people can just go to one spot and see everything um i think yeah you guys all do that as well but if you haven't like setting up a website is pretty easy to do thank you that was really really good that was that was exceptional no thank you so much for having me it's so fun it's so nice to talk to talk to people about this stuff it gets me really excited it was great and yeah we can definitely see your enthusiasm it's wonderful